Well, good morning. It's good to be here today. I could always tell when the Dolphins are playing at home because I see a lot of faces in the first hour. So um, that's okay. And as long as, you know, you get your priorities straight, that's a, that's a good thing. I hope they have a good time, and I hope we win. Uh, for the rest of us, it's good to be here today. And you slept a little longer than the first service, so I hope you're, you're ready. We are in week two of our series, Together Is better and last week we had Sam and Corita with us and the week before Russell started off the series with the idea of together we find peace together we find peace so today we're going to be talking about together we experience love together we experience love so as we get started today we have one idea that's going to carry us throughout this passage and it's the following I'll read it first so you can fill in the blank and then I would like us to all read it together and here it is the riches of God's love and power are experienced through God's spirit in relationship with God's people let me read that one more time the riches of God's love and power are experienced through God's spirit in relationship with God's people so now let's read that all together ready one two three the riches of God's love and power are experienced through God's Spirit in relationship with God's people. So what we're going to see today is how God's Spirit really weaves us together to experience a greater measure of God's love, a greater measure of His presence, and, and really for us to have a better understanding of who God is and what does it mean to love God and love one another? You know, as we get started today, we're drawn to this idea. There are some things that go together. Okay, so today we're going to do a little test. Ready? Here we go. Salt and pepper. Okay. Peanut butter and jelly. Batman and Adam and Eve. Hide and seek. Pros and cons for wonder woman and pastor russell and beverly you didn't see that coming i know just want to make sure you're all awake today so there's some things that go together and these are things that they're just you know instinctive they're things that we say they're things that we're th you know we think about you say a certain word another word pops into your mind but here's the question i'd like you to consider this morning what do non-church people, that's people that don't attend church, they don't go to church, that's not a priority for them, what do non-church people think of when they hear the word church? So what do they think of? What comes to their mind? What is it that they say to you or to us in response to that word? Because that word church elicits a lot of different emotions and feelings. For an example, some of these are positive, some of them are negative. Some of them are, are somewhere in between, depends upon your experience. Now, for someone, they hear this word church, what comes to their mind is rejection. That's the word. They, they see church and rejection. For others, it's pain, church and pain. Something happened in their lives, church was affiliated with that pain so every time they hear the word church they look back and they think about a time in their lives where they experience a lot of pain for some it might be church and deceit maybe they were misled by someone in their church and they have an issue now trusting other people who go to church for some they may say oh church and hypocrites that's an easy one for some it's church and lies for others, it's church and abuse. But I would say the majority of us, at least here today, it'd be church and forgiveness. It would be church and, and hope. It would be church and family. It would be church and friends. It would be church and Jesus. So now the challenge for you and I is, is the following. 
How do we help create an inseparable link between the word church and love? How do we help people understand that the church is about love? It's about loving God. It's about loving other people. Because Jesus told his disciples, they're going to know that you are mine because of your what? Because of your love. It's not the Bible translation you use. It's not how many prayers you can recite by memory. It's not the building, whether it's a multi-purpose building or a church in the steeple. It's none of that. It's what? It's love. That's how people know that you really love God. That's how people know you belong to God. It's your love. So for those that have been hurt, for those that have been mistreated, for those that have been, you know, rejected by church, how do we help them understand, listen, church is really about love. So how do we get there? Well, I'd like you to remember a foundational truth that we rest on. It's here in your notes. Jesus came to give us access to the Father that we might be together forever with the Father, Son, and Spirit. So the reason Jesus came was that you and I can unite in spirit with God for all of eternity. That's why he came. He didn't come because he was bored in heaven. He didn't come because there was nothing else to do. He came because we were, as the scripture says, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, what did Jesus have in heaven? He had everything. Jesus was rich. The rich came down to earth to become what? Poor. The rich became poor to give the dead, that's you and me, life. That's what Jesus did. He came down, all the riches of his glory, he said, I'm going to come down to the earth to live among people who are spiritually dead, so that by believing in me, they may have life and one day experience the riches that I have to offer. So these riches are not necessarily material riches. They're not necessarily, you know, bricks and, and finances. They are spiritual riches. So the rich became poor to give the dead life. That's why Jesus came. Now, it says, remember, be changed. Together, we must be continuously changed in our hearts by the Spirit of God to experience and release Christ's love to others. So this message of Jesus coming to die on a cross for our sins, to be buried, to be risen from the grave, to go back to the Father, this message was to start an event that would continue in a process of change and transformation. So the way you know that you're growing spiritually is really simplified by one simple word. That's the word love. If I am growing in my love for people, that is a strong indicator that I'm growing spiritually. If I am not growing in my love for God and in my love for people, that is a very strong indicator that I'm not growing spiritually, no matter what I may know. So love is a commandment. It is not optional. If God's love compelled him to leave heaven with all of his riches and all of his glory to come to this earth to live among us, the poor, the poor spiritually, to give us life so that we can have and experience the riches of Christ, then should we not do the same with others? Now, a little background, as Russell mentioned last time, the church of Ephesus was having a difficult time. They were going through difficulties in their church, but Paul also was going through difficulties. You remember where he was? He was in jail. Under house arrest, he was incarcerated, unable to visit the churches. All he could do was write and pray and try to encourage the people, but he was really not available. He was set apart, but God had a special purpose during this time. So why the emphasis on being together? Why does the Bible emphasize so much the importance of you and I as his children being together? 
Well, when we are together, we discover our purposes for this life. We, had a, our, we have a men's coaching group that meets about once a month. And in the men's coaching group, it was funny because Sam Masters came on Friday night to the men's coaching group with two of his guys from Argentina. And one of our men was there, and I didn't know this, but he said, yeah, Sam, when you were here, you know, over 20 years ago, you had encouraged me to go and study education. And because of, you know, the things I was interested in, and I went and I studied that, and today I'm a teacher and I, I love what I do. So in, in the church environment, in the context of loving relationships, we learn about each other, we stimulate one another towards love and good works, we discover our purpose, and the reason is why. Why does all this happen? And it's very simple. Because together is what? Together is better. The way you discover God's purposes for your life is not outside of the church context. It's within the context of the church. It's within loving relationships with God's people. And let's be honest. Sometimes when somebody loves you, they have to say something that's very difficult for you to hear. How many of you have heard something difficult from someone that loves you, right? You don't like it. You may change your facial expressions. You may pant a little bit. But you know... They're telling you something because they love you. So in this passage today, what we're going to look at, this is a prayer, but it's also a way of Paul encouraging the people to put into practice what they already know. I've said this many times, and it's nothing new. I think one of the challenges we have as Christians is we are spiritually constipated. We have more information. We know more about the Bible than we are practicing in our daily lives so what God wants us to do and in this passage what it encourages us to do is to put into practice what you know what we already have for example how many of you are car you know lovers you just love cars you're always reading about cars when the new model comes out you know all the specs you're telling your friends you know some of us are like why, why did you know you know you subscribe to the magazines you just love cars well, you may know a lot about cars, but there may be another person who absolutely knows nothing about cars. They don't know how to tune up their car or change the battery or change their oil. All they know is they put the key in the ignition, they turn it, and they go. And occasionally they have to stop at this place called the gas station and fill it up with fuel. Now, the amazing thing in all of this is the following. Whether you know a lot about cars or you know nothing about cars, it takes very little information for you to what? Drive the car. So you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be a, an expert. All you need to know is that the key goes in the ignition. You turn it to the right, you hit the gas, and you go. So in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul is trying to encourage the church to put the spiritual key in the ignition and go. You already have what you need. You already know what you need. So stop waiting and start doing. Now, it would be like if you are searching for a job today. You can be very spiritual about it. You can sit in your house and say, I'm just going to pray six hours a day for a job and wait for that phone to ring. How many of you think that person will be hungry in a few weeks? What do you have to do? You have to take action. You have to go online. You have to just show up and, and you have to be there and interview and network because all of this stuff requires not just knowing information, but doing what you know. So look here in your bulletin if you have Ephesians 3. If you have your Bible, you can open up to Ephesians 3. Today we're going to read out of the English Standard Version and this is what Paul says. He says, So, I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit. Where? Where does he say? In your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints 
what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So here's the first point I'd like you to write down. We experience the riches of Christ's love and power when we're together. When we're together. And this is a very simple statement, but it's a very powerful statement. When we come together, there's a measure of God's love. There's an experience of God's love. There's something that he wants us to get out of this that we will not experience apart from one another. You know, it's like when you're traveling. You know, you're traveling and you might be in one state and your family might be scattered in a different state. You know, no matter how much you try to talk on the phone or connect by FaceTime or Zoom or something else, there's nothing like coming together in person as a family and talking and spending time with each other. There's just nothing that compares to it. Now, let's go back to our main idea for just a minute. And I'd like you again to help me to read it all together. Ready? One, two, three. The riches of God's love and power are experienced through God's Spirit in relationship with God's people. So now, look at verse 13 once again. He says, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Why would Paul say something like that? Why would he say, hey, I'm suffering for you? Well, sometime before, Jesus approached him and said, I want you to go to the Gentiles. I want you to go to the non-Jews. I want you to go to the people who have not been even looking for me, but I am going to go after them. And Paul, you're my messenger. Go and reach them. So Paul was telling them, listen, don't be discouraged. You know, I know you're suffering. Don't be depressed. Don't lose heart. You know, there's a bigger purpose for my suffering. Don't lose hope. Don't give up. And then he says in verse 14, for this reason, notice the humility. Notice the, the posture. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So how does Paul approach what he's about to say? This prayer is given in great humility. Can I encourage you with something as you pray? It's not a matter of, do I have to pray kneeling down or, or with my hands, you know, lifted high? It, it's not as important, you know, what you're doing when you pray as it is the attitude that you and I have when we pray. You know, if you pray standing up, that's fine. If you pray sitting down, that's fine. If you like to pray on your knees because it helps you focus, that's fine. If you pray laying down in your bed, you'll probably go to sleep. So I don't practice that very often. But what God is looking for is not your physical posture. He's looking for your spiritual posture. He's looking to see if you're going to humble yourself before him and say, Lord, God of heaven, this is, you know, I'm praying to a God. You know, God is not your homeboy. He's not your bro. He is the infinite and almighty God. And when we approach him, we've got to remember that. Yes, he is our, he is our friend. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. But he's the God of heaven and he's the God of earth. And Paul says, you know, I bow my knees before the Father. But notice what he says. He goes, that according to the riches of his glory. He's not talking about physical stuff. He may grant you to be strengthened. Now, this is really important. You may want to underline this in your bulletin. That he may grant you to be, and here it is, strengthen, notice, strengthen with what? Circle that word. Strengthen with power. How? That's the question, right? How am I going to be strengthened with power? He gives us the answer. Through his what? 
Through His Spirit. That's how we're strengthened. Where are we strengthened? That's the next question. Here it is. In your inner being. You have an inner person. You have an outer person. We focus more typically on what? The outer person, right? You know, when I see friends and I haven't seen in a long time, they said, hey, I noticed you got a few more gray hairs just for men. You find it on aisle six, right? Okay. Hey, you know, there's one lady in the Spanish service. Every time she sees me, estás gordito, you're getting chubby. Okay. You know, it's just fine. We typically focus on the exterior. God wants to strengthen your interior. God wants to strengthen your person so that you and I can take all that God has given us in his riches and use it to love him and love one another. So it says in your notes, God strengthens us according to the riches of his glory. That is, out of his abundance, we know that God is not poor. God is infinitely rich and glorious. And he doesn't do this out of our scarcity. You know, we, we are limited. We are limited in strength, in finances, in energy. We are limited. God is not limited. Don't pray to God like he has the limitations that you have. He doesn't. Don't pray to God like he is limited by your mind and my mind. He isn't. We cannot capture in this mind, in this brain of ours, the infinite riches and glory of God. We just can't do it. It's beyond our human capacity. But I also want you to know, God also gives generously, as it says here, in proportion to what he has. You know, when we go to God and we pray, do we pray for more or do we pray for less? Sometimes we pray, Lord, I want you to to just change that person's heart in this family. Why not pray for the entire family? Don't just pray for one person at your school or or one person at your job. Pray for the department. Pray for the district. Pray for the region. Pray for everyone that you possibly can for God's will to be done. So, this is really interesting. So, God is what? Infinitely glorious, infinitely generous. And what did he do? He became what? Poor. So that you and I, without life, might have life. The riches of God's glory is beyond our comprehension. Why would God do that? Because of his great love for us. So notice the flow. God's strength with power through the Holy Spirit, to our inner person, and here's the reason. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, as you, as you look at this, you may look at it and say, well, isn't that backwards? So that Christ may dwell in our, in our hearts through faith? You know, no, it really, it really isn't backwards. Because he's not necessarily talking about our salvation He's talking about something different. He's talking about after our salvation, as God progresses us spiritually through the power of the Holy Spirit. For an example, he says that Christ may dwell. That word dwell is really important for us to understand. It comes from a compound Greek word, and the part of it means down, and the other part means to to live or to dwell. Now, many of us here, not all of us, but many of us have stayed in a hotel before that we really felt out of place, right? Maybe it was dirty, maybe it was loud, but we just didn't feel comfortable there, so we were just counting down the hours so that we could just leave. In the spiritual world, when you and I accept Christ as our Savior, Jesus comes, His Spirit comes to live where? Within us. He dwells in us. He habitates. He dwells in his people. Now, the question becomes, is Jesus comfortable in the home of our hearts or is Jesus uncomfortable 
being there. For an example, as one author put in his book, you know, there are like different spaces in our hearts, much like a home has rooms. So imagine the, the entrance of your, of your home. It may look like this. It may not look like this. You know, the entrance of our home and your home or your apartment or your efficiency or your townhouse, you know, your townhouse, whenever you open the door, that's like the first thing you see, you know, the first impression of your home. So if Jesus were to take habitation in your home, what is the first thing he sees or he will see as he looks inside your heart? What's the biggest, most obvious thing that he sees? Is it peace? Is it love? Is it anger? Is it bitterness? Is it hate? Is it anxiety? What is it? It's the most obvious thing that not only Jesus sees, but everyone else can see and listen. Because out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. So not only can he see it, but what is it that others hear coming out of your heart that is very obvious, pointing back to the contents of your heart? So then we go into the living room. The living room is a place where we often have a TV. Some of us have a small TV. Some of us have a large TV. You know, we use the living room for conversations with friends and family. So if Jesus were to be in the heart, you know, in the home of your heart, in the heart of your home, you know what I'm saying. You know, if he's there, would he feel comfortable with those conversations? Would he feel comfortable with what you're watching? Or would he feel very, very uncomfortable? Would he go to another room? Would he have to look away? Then we have the dining room. The dining room is where we often come together as a family and we eat. You know, some people enjoy a, a good dinner. That's the, the meal they look forward to more than any other one. And, and we have an appetite and we're ready to, to eat and, and chow down. And, and then he, he comes into the dining room of our heart. And the question is, what does our heart desire? What are the appetites that you and I crave in our hearts? What is it that we're pursuing and that we think about and we just can't wait? But then we get to the bedroom. The bedroom is a private room. It's where we have private thoughts and we do private things. So what would Jesus think and feel if he would live there with you in the bedroom? Then we go in the bathroom. And the bathroom is where, well, we, we go and we, we shower and we often look at our, our hair and our face or our body and, and see where, you know, are we dirty? Are we scratched up? You know, do we have a, a new mark on our body? What, what's going on? And, and what would Jesus see if he would come in there with us? Not the physical bathroom, but the bathroom of our heart. What, what is the reality of us before God? Are we clean? Are we holy? Are we ashamed when we look in the mirror and Jesus is there looking next to us? And then last but not least is the closet. The closet is, yes, where we hang our clothes, but oftentimes it's where we hide things that we don't want others to find. Maybe it's just not appropriate for that age. We sometimes put a lock on things. We sometimes close it and make sure they, they don't go into this part and sometimes we do the very same thing with Christ we say Lord you know I've given you the kitchen you know it's in the bathroom you've got the hallway but not the closet there's something there I don't want you to see there, there's something there that you're going to feel very uncomfortable with so the question is in your heart today does Jesus feel like a visitor who is uncomfortable? Or does he feel as Lord and he can do what he needs to do and you will make whatever change you need to make? I want you to listen to this scripture. Maybe this will help give you a different understanding. Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. 
and my father will love him notice and we will come to him and make our what our home with him what does it mean to dwell with christ it means that jesus is occupying not only my heart but the decision making and the motives and the reasons and everything is available to him to change whenever he wants so look at verse 17 it says so that christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love so here's the next point ready together we experience a greater measure of christ's love together we learn and experience a greater measure of christ's love i want you to know i have learned how to love people better simply by watching some of you love others I'm just being perfectly honest God has shown me so many ways to love people that I did not do before that now I have done because of what I've learned from many of you. And that's the way the Christian life is supposed to be. You know, I don't have a perfect love, although I have a perfect love that lives within me. You don't have a perfect love, although you have a perfect love that lives within you. And as you and I work together meet together we all learn from each other how to love people better it's like the guy who says and, and this is very common you know they they may say start coming to church and they start coming to group and then you learn well you know i haven't talked to my dad or my brother or my sister or my mom i haven't talked to them in the last seven years because they, they said this to me or they did this to me. And in our family, we do not forgive when people offend us. Wow. And then they hear somebody in the group. And that person in the group begins to share about a situation that happened at work. And how in that situation at work, they were mistreated by someone. They, they you know, lies were told about them. And it got really serious and they actually terminated that person because of what the person had said and and they had done nothing wrong and the person at the very beginning said you know this is a difficult thing that i've experienced but i remember in the first days i decided no matter what happens here i will not hold a grudge against that person i'm going to love them and i'm going to serve them and whatever happens happens god is control god is in control and i'm not going to worry about it and then this guy in the small group learns wow if you can forgive that person for making them you know lose your job and all this stuff and all the embarrassment and all the financial turmoil that your family went through maybe i need to do the same maybe i need to stop being so prideful and call my mom or call my dad or call my brother and say you know what I'm sorry for being such a jerk all these years. I forgive you for what you've done. Can we just hit the reset button and start over? How do you learn that? You learn that by watching and looking and observing and listening. God's people practice what Paul is saying here. So together we learn and experience a greater measure of Christ's love so paul gives us three reasons for this idea of being rooted and grounded in love he gives us three reasons so before we get to that let's look back once again at the main idea and i want you again to help me read the main idea all together it's going to be up on the screen in a minute and it's in your bulletin ready the riches of god's love all together here we go the riches of god's love and power are experienced through God's Spirit in relationship with God's people. So here's the first one. Together, we can comprehend the greatness of Christ's love. Notice, there is a level of understanding that comes with learning about the love of Christ. From now until the day that God calls us home 
or until the day that Christ comes back, we're going to be learning about God's love. We're really not going to fully understand it until we meet Christ because it's so beyond comprehension. But as we've said already, the more you and I interact with God's people, the more we are together, the more we learn what that love means. So look at verse 17 again. That you, Paul says, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints. Would you underline that phrase? With all the saints. What is the breadth and length and height and depth? Now, what Paul is not saying here is that the length of God's love, the breadth of God's love, the height of God's love, the depth of God's love has a specific measurement. It doesn't. It is infinite. What he's saying here is that God's love is complete. It really is. I mean, if, if you are married, you know, you ask the question sometimes, hopefully, Lord, how can I increase my love for my spouse? What can I do for them? How can I show them, you know, a greater measure of love? How can I do that? Well, you don't learn that, you know, the week after your honeymoon. That takes a long time. I mean, after, you know, 27 plus years, you know, now is when we, we get certain things that we didn't get 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And that's just part of, of life and learning from one another. But God's love is, is complete. It is deep, it is wide, it is high, and it is low. So here's the, the next point. Together, we can see grace, mercy, and forgiveness in action. Together, we can see grace, mercy, and forgiveness in action. So here's where we all land. At one point in our lives, we were all a spiritual mess. I know that's encouraging this morning, right? But we were all, at one point in our lives, a spiritual mess. But what happened? The rich became what? Poor to give the dead life. Because you and I were a spiritual mess, Christ himself came in the form of a man, he lived on this earth without sin. He fixed our mess. He healed. He taught. He helped. When he went to the cross, and he died on the cross, and he shed his blood, and he was buried, and then he rose again from the grave. Why did he do that? Because the richness of God is beyond measure. Why would an infinite God give up his son for a group of people that were not even looking for him. A group of people who were looking for their own satisfaction and their own desires, and they weren't looking for God. It's because of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. I want you to think for just a minute, recently, in your groups, and, you know, it's funny because after we start our small group, it's kind of like after the, the first and second week, everybody behaves, right? Everybody comes, and uh, I'm St. Marcel, and you're St. Bruce, and you're St. You know, nice to meet you. And, but by the third week, we start sharing, hey, you know, this is how I came to know Christ. And some of the stories, I mean, my story is, you know, really boring, but some of the stories are just like, wow, this is amazing. And you see God's grace in the hand of people. You know, I was just having a conversation with somebody and, you know, at the end of the message and, and they were saying how, you know, hey, I, I came to the church and, and you know, I was in a, a Catholic church and, you know, the person I was living with was in another church and we started coming and we started hearing God's word. So I, I gave my heart to light, you know, my heart to Christ and, and we started walking with the Lord and, and we got, you know, baptized and now we realize, well, we're, we're living together and we're not married and that doesn't honor God. So I want to take the next step and I want to honor God and I want us to, to get married. And, and, and I'm just sitting there and I'm just listening to the, the person speak and I'm thinking, that is incredible. 
how God can take someone who is a spiritual mess, like you and I once were, and little by little, he starts working in their hearts, he starts showing them that their way is not the right way, and he starts showing them this is the way, walk in it. And then that person, instead of saying, no, you know, that's what the church says, I've got a better way, they're humble enough to say, if this is what God wants, it's what I want. And sometimes, if I can be honest, I've got to like hold back the tears because the simplicity of obeying God is powerful. It's powerful. And you see that when the rich becomes poor and the poor realizes that he or she is really poor and blind and destitute and naked and has no chance to reach God on their own, and they agree with God that they're a sinner. And they will follow God by faith. You see a story of God's grace revealed right in front of your eyes. And let me tell you, there is no greater story than the story of God's grace in the life of someone who accepts it and follows it. So what is your story? Do you have a story of grace? Do you have a story of forgiveness? Do you have a story of, of mercy? If not, at the end of the service, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond. So together we can practice Christ's love and learn from each other. This is the amazing thing about the God that we serve. And, and I'm telling you, it happens every small group whether somebody has just come to know Christ as their Savior or they've been with Christ a long time, I learned something new about the love of God through the people of God as they submit their lives to the Spirit of God. It always, always happens. So point number two. Together, we can personally know the love of Christ. Together, we can personally know the love of Christ. I remember when I was growing up and I was the youngest of all of my friends. You know, I was 10. They were like 16 years old. We would play baseball together, football together. You know, I was a chubby dude so I could hang with them on the sports and, you know, we would have fun together. But I would always remember that they were always really good at having girlfriends and I was not. So I was like, you know, man, you know, I don't know what it's like to have a girlfriend, but, you know, you've had like three or four girlfriends, you know, what's, what's the secret? And, you know, and it was this funny feeling like, okay, it would be nice to know what it means to have a girlfriend. Obviously, I met a girlfriend later, but at that time, it was a challenge. So many times, we have this thought, I know this person knows God. They have a real relationship with him. You can see it in their face. You can see it in the, in the way they speak. You can see it in what they do and how generous they are. They know God. They really know God. I don't know God the way they know God. And, and it's not a, a jealousy thing. It's more like a, man, I, I, wish, I wish I could really know God like they do. Because if I'm honest with myself, I, I don't really know him, but I would like to. The promise that Paul tells us here, he says in verse 19, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. We're not going to know everything there is to know about Christ, but we can know Christ experientially. God wants to reveal His love. He wants to reveal His Son experientially to us. He wants us to personally know God. More than anything else, He wants us to personally know Him. And the way we learn to know Him, in part, is the context of being with other brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how we come to know Him. You know, some of us, when we first came to know Christ, we, we came with all this relational baggage. And we didn't really know how to treat our, our friends or our family members or our spouses if we were married. And through our, our knowledge of Christ, we came to know Christ personally. 
And he started showing us how to treat other people. That, that doesn't happen automatically. It happens through experience. But God's love is also relational. It was designed to be shared with others. God's love is not for you to hog all for yourself. You know, it's not for you to just consume all for yourself. If you've ever watched those, you know, Guinness World Record hot dog eating contests, how many of you can watch that and stomach it? You know, I don't know what the latest world record is, you know, 80 hot dogs or something, I don't know. But they're just like putting it down, right? You know, I'm not sure if they're kosher dogs or non-kosher, I don't know, but they're just packing it down. The Christian life is not about packing it down. It's about letting it soak so you can give it out. It's about letting God do a work in you so that he could do a work outside into the hearts and minds of other people. But you're not going to love people if you don't love God. You're not going to understand the measure of God's love unless you really seek to know him. But here's the good news. God is not hiding from us. God is not hiding from you. He wants you to really know him. Point number three. Together, we can be filled with all the fullness of God. Together, we can be filled with all the fullness of God. And going back to our analogy of our heart being a home, for Christ to fill us, we have to empty ourselves. It implies that we are emptied of the fullness of ourselves. Now, every Tuesday and sometimes Wednesday morning, about 5.30 in the morning, a gigantic garbage truck comes around the back of our building. And I really feel bad for, for some of our neighbors because they go in and they lift the six-yard canister in the air and they shake it and the dogs bark and they do that so that all the garbage inside the canister can what? Be empty, just come out, fall into the garbage truck. And they back out and then it's beeping on the way back and, you know, they head out and it's every week because we, we have to have the service. The reason they empty it out every single week is so that we can do what? Fill it up. If we didn't have a need to fill up a six-yarder, well, maybe we can order a three-yarder or something smaller. But the fact is, we've got a lot of trash. We have a lot of things we have to throw away, even though we, we recycle other things. The only way you and I can be filled with the fullness of God is if we are emptied of the fullness of ourselves. Listen, the biggest challenge that we have in our marriage is not our spouse. It's that we cannot get out of the way of ourselves. The challenge that we often have in relationships, being married or not married, you know, if you're a single person, it's that we want our way and we're going to push to get our way. But when Jesus came, he came to serve and love, not to demand. Emptiness, it says here, emptiness of self precedes the fullness of God. So as you look around the chambers of your heart, what is it that is still full with the contents that you have placed there? Those are the very contents that God wants to empty and throw away and remove. Listen, and none of us are exempt from this. I mean, I can promise you, everyone, I know for me it's, it happens, you know, sometime this week, you had a thought or you, or you said something that you knew you shouldn't have said that way. It, it's, a, it's a challenge that we all face. None of us are immune to it. You know, we don't always have a godly attitude. You know, some of us in the morning, it's like, man, get away from that person because they're like, you know, they don't even want to talk to you in the morning. But 
God knows this. He knows that we, we struggle. He knows that we're not always aligned with His Spirit. And He gives us the grace. But the fact of the matter is, sometimes there's garbage in our heart that must be thrown out. Together, it says, we stimulate one another to love, or to live, rather, holy and surrendered lives. Together, we stimulate one another to live holy and surrendered lives. So next, next week is week three of our life groups. People start feeling more comfortable, and somebody brings something up in a, in a conversation, and they're just, you know, having a rough time with it, and someone in the group realizes, you know, what they're thinking and what they're doing, that, that just doesn't align with what the Bible says. And, and they say, hey, have you thought of doing it this way? Have you thought of, you know, trying this instead of what you've been doing? And in that process, we stimulate each other to what? To love and practice good works. So we can only do that when we're together. Oftentimes before church and after church, we do the same things. There are private conversations sometimes that happen. We do that to stimulate one another toward love and good works. Why? Because together is, is better. Listen, all of us have blind spots. All of us do. I need others to point out blind spots in my life, and so do you. You know, none of us, you know, comes to church on a cloud accompanied by a heavenly host of angels. None of us do. We all have to put on our pants the same way, get dressed the same way, and have breath. We, we are all in the same boat. But together, we learn how we can really love people. So three points as we close. Number one, connection. We need healthy spiritual relationships to grow. Do you believe that? We need healthy spiritual relationships to grow. Who that you spend time with is challenging you to take more steps of faith, to obey God in a way or, or set some spiritual goals or milestones. Who is it that you're hanging around with that is challenging you to do something greater for God? Well, nobody. Find someone. Find someone in your group. Find someone to challenge you to do more for God, to believe God more, to trust God more. Comfort. We are commanded to encourage one another. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is our comforter. What does that mean? He comes alongside to encourage us. Listen, as Russell mentioned earlier, there are people in our church that are having a difficult time, like the Ephesians were having it, and in a different way. We're here to comfort one another, strengthen one another. And number three, collaboration. We work together for an eternal purpose. We're not here to see who has the latest purse. We're not here to see who has the nicest nails or the coolest car or the nicest watch or, you know, who's selling the latest skincare products. That's not what we're here for. We're here to encourage one another and we're here to stimulate one another to do the purpose that God has created us to do. That's why we're here. In our groups, we've given the leaders a challenge and we want every group to come together and decide what can we do for somebody that someone in our group knows to serve them in a practical way to show the love of Christ? That's what we're here for. We all have busy lives and we all have busy schedules, but we have to come together to collaborate, to comfort, and to connect with one another. We can only do this together. The riches of God's love and power are experienced through God's Spirit in relationship with God's people. So what I'd like to do as we end our time together today is focus on the riches 
of God's glory. Many times we'll read a passage or listen to a passage and sometimes structurally because of the way it's put together in a paragraph form. And by the way, when the Bible was written, it wasn't written with numbers and references like you see here. This was put in afterwards for, for our help. But it was written as a letter, just one long letter to the Ephesians. But I wanted to structure this a little bit differently. And it's not all directly from the Scripture. But I think this will help you just get a different understanding of what we're saying here today. So notice what it says. His Spirit strengthens our spirit with what? With power. Christ dwells in our hearts through what? We are rooted and grounded in love. We have strength to do what? To comprehend with the saints the breadth, the length, height, and depth of Christ's love. We have strength to personally what? Know the love of Christ. How big is it? It surpasses knowledge. We have strength to be filled with all the fullness of God. God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. According to the power at work, where is this power? Where is this power? Where is this power? Do you really believe that? The power of God, the riches of Christ, the fullness of God is contained in us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Amen. Together, we experience love. We experience a greater measure of God's love together. So if you are not meeting with others, if you are not coming together with God's people on a regular basis, let me tell you, you're missing out on what God has for you. You, you really are. You're missing out on what God wants to teach you through His people. Because together we experience love. The riches of God's love and power are experienced through God's Spirit. Notice, in relationship with God's people. What does Paul want you and I to do? He wants us to start the engine. He wants us to stop learning the Bible and doing nothing. He wants us to learn and practice what we already know. That's his prayer in Ephesians 3. That's our prayer today. Would you bow your heads? As you think about what we've talked about this morning, I just have a few simple questions. Today, right now, How's your heart? How's your heart? We've talked about the reality of our heart and how we have this ability to, to divide it up, so to speak. But the question I have is, is Jesus comfortable? Is he at home in every area of your heart, of your life? Is there an area that's off limits? Is there an area of your heart that you don't want to give them access to? I'm talking to the believers right now. If that's you, why not confess right now to the Lord? Lord, you know this area of my heart, I've made excuses, I've hidden it, I haven't dealt with it, but I know that it is sin. It is trash. And it's time to empty the trash. Lord, forgive me of that sin.
For others, are you making time to be with God's people? Are you making it a priority? God wants you to experience a greater measure of his love through his people, the church. And if there is someone here today who you said, you know, Marcel, you mentioned that Christ was rich. He came down to live among the poor. And he searched for those who were dead spiritually. And he did so so that he can give them life. And if I'm honest with you and if I'm honest with God today, I do not know Christ as my Savior. I've heard about him. I've come to church before, or maybe I haven't. But I don't know for sure that Jesus is my Savior. I can actually say I, I do know. He's not. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, but you would like to give your heart to Him, would you just raise your hand? If you've never accepted Christ, thank you. If you've never accepted Christ, if you say, Marcel, I, I don't have Christ living within me. Right there where you are. Would you just pray, Lord Jesus, today I, I give you my heart, all of my heart. Lord, you know that I am a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I pray, Lord, that you would forgive me for all of my sins. Lord, make me clean. Make me yours. I believe that Jesus came. He was rich. But for my sake, he became poor. I believe that he lived a life without sin. I believe that he suffered on the cross and died and was buried. But after three days, I do believe that he rose from the grave. So today I invite Jesus. Lord, come into my heart. Change and clean everything that you need to. Make me your child today and help me to follow you all the days of my life. For it's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen.